There's a passage where the Buddha divides emotions into two sorts. There are household emotions and renunciate emotions. Household emotions are ordinary joy, sorrow, equanimity. When you get sights, sounds, smells, taste, tactile sensations, ideas that you like, that's household of joy. Household sorrow is when you get things through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind that you don't like. That's where equanimity is in the face of sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations. The mind is equanimous. As for renunciate emotions, renunciate sorrow is when you realize there is a goal, but you haven't reached it yet. It is possible to put an end to suffering. People have done it, but you're not there. Renunciate joy is when you've the joy you feel on reaching the goal, and renunciate equanimity is the equanimity you feel when you have that joy. And the Buddha makes an interesting comment. He says, you, when you're suffering from householder sorrow or householder grief, you don't want to try to replace it with householder joy, because it just keeps going back and forth, back and forth. It doesn't go anywhere. If you want it to go someplace, you replace it with renunciate grief. Because it's the impetus to practice. It all sounds very abstract. But think about grief. Situations where we're losing someone or something that we hold dear. Now, how does the Buddha recommend that we react? He says you think about how this is not the only time this has happened. How many times over the course of many lifetimes have you experienced that same grief, that same loss? There's that story of the woman who was crying after her daughter in the cemetery. The daughter's name was Jiva, which means life, ironically. But Jiva was now dead, buried in the cemetery. And she was crying after her. And the Buddha happened to hear her. And he asked her, Do you realize how many Jivas there are buried in that cemetery? How many you've buried in that cemetery? 84,000. Which one are you crying for? Now, she later said she came to her senses. It seems strange that thinking about so many deaths is actually lighter than thinking about one death. But it takes a lot of the personal sting out of the loss. You realize that you're not the only one being singled out for this. This happens all the time, and it's happened for many, many times to you. When you think about that, you have a sense of compassion for everybody else who's lost a loved one. You see how much it hurts, and you realize everybody's been going through this. That opens the heart. Get you out of yourself. In ancient India, they had an aesthetic theory, which answered the question, why is it that, say you have a play about something horrible happening, and people want to come and watch it? They enjoy watching it, and it's not a sadistic pleasure that they get out of it. They empathize with the hero or heroine going through that suffering. So what? What is it? What's the pleasure? And they came with the, the theory that the audience doesn't really experience the same emotions as the person on the stage is portraying. They taste the emotion, and the taste is different from the experience. And the taste of seeing someone portraying grief is compassion. You're at one remove from the grief. And that expands your heart. So allow yourself to think in those larger terms. But once the heart is expanded like that, you don't stay right there. 
this compassion then moves on to sangwega. You realize how this is going to keep on going on if you don't do something about it. And the idea of having to go through this again and again and again, that gets oppressive. So the focus is back on you. What are you going to do now? And the proper response to sangwega is basada. There's got to be a way out. And that's those five reflections that we chant so often are subject to aging, illness, death, separation. That's all sangwega. Then we get to, I'm the owner of my actions, heir to my actions. That's the basada. You focus on your actions. It is possible to do something to get out. That's renunciate grief. It's possible to do it, but you're not there yet. It may not be a pleasant emotion, but at least it has some hope. Like the string on a bow. You pull it back so it's taut and the arrow can fly. In other words, there's a tension in that renunciate grief, which gives you the impetus to keep on practicing. As you reflect back, how many times you've had to grieve in the past. And the emotion of compassion does get you out of the grief a little bit, but it doesn't solve the problem. Because you're back with your own feelings again. But you've come back with a different perspective. This is a pattern you see often in the Buddhist teachings. Think about the knowledge as he gained on the night of his awakening. The first knowledge was about himself. All the many lifetimes he'd been through, all the different pleasures and pains, what he ate, what he looked like, and how he died. And then he came back again, more pleasures, more pains, over and over and over again. But it's all about him. In the second knowledge, he took a wider perspective and realized this wasn't just him. Everybody was going through this. Seeing people going up, going down, going up and then going down again, going down and coming back up again. And seeing that gave him a strong sense of sangwega. He talks about this in many of his similes. The similes where he asks the monks, which is greater, the water in all the oceans or the tears you've shed going through these many lifetimes? It's the tears you've shed. So that gave him the impetus to want to get out. That's what the third knowledge was all about, how do you get out? We well, go into your mind and see, see what in the mind is the basis for all this birth and death. What's the foundation? Because we keep coming back, coming back. We suffer from these things and we come back for more, largely because we get focused on the pleasures. And even as they're falling from our grasp, we keep thinking, well, maybe if I come back the next time I can hold on to it a little bit longer. And then it gets torn away again. How about a little bit longer? It gets torn away again. And then Buddha began to realize he, he couldn't have nostalgia for his past pleasures. This is something we have to watch out for. A lot of people have told me that during the pandemic, when they've had a lot more time by themselves in confinement, one way or another, the mind starts going back to the past. On the one hand, they think about some of the horrible things they did or horrible things that were done to them. But on the other hand, there are the things that they used to be able to do and they miss. And you don't want either of those to be in your mind when the time comes for you to actually go. Because the things you miss, they're not going to be that way when you come back. Remember going to the, the Buddhist holy spots? And you see these people who were born right near the holy, holy spots. They were able to eke out a living based on the tourists coming through. 
And you wonder how many of them in previous lifetimes have been Buddhists, and they say, may I, may I live in the Buddhist holy spots? Because for many Buddhists that was the highlight of their lives, going on pilgrimage. They thought, wouldn't it be good to have a life where you're right there all the time? Well, they're right, they came back and they're right there, but the situation is different now. Hardly any Buddhists live in those areas. The people who hang around tend to be poor, though it seems so good in the memory. It was a world that doesn't exist anymore. So you've really got to train the mind, because otherwise it's just going to keep trying to find the pleasure that it thought it might have had or could have had, just missed, and it's going to come back and try for it again. So you've got to look deep into the mind, because that's where all of this points. After all, the Buddha found this path because he was looking for a path that would lead to something that had no sorrow, no aging, no illness, no death, no sorrow, no lamentation, no pain, no distress, no despair. They found it, found it looking here. It's when you reach that point, that's when you found the answer. That question is, do we have to keep on suffering? And the Buddha says, you get here, and the answer is no, there is a way out. So even though the realization that you're not there yet is painful, it's pain with a purpose. Because so many other pains in life have no purpose at all. They go nowhere. They just weigh you down, weigh you down, weigh you down. And you ask, well, what was accomplished by that? Nothing. Then why? Because. One of those because is the dot, dot, dot. Because the mind still has craving and clinging. This is where the sorrow comes from. When the Buddha said, this is the origination of suffering, that's what he meant. It's because of this that we keep coming back and inflicting ourselves with more and more suffering. So here's the area where we need to work, and this is the area where something can be accomplished, even though the path is painful. As I said, it does serve a purpose that lies outside of the pain. So when you're suffering from household grief, remember the Buddha's cure was renunciate grief, because renunciate grief doesn't stay there. It moves on to renunciate joy, renunciate equanimity. And it's a path we all can follow by enlarging our minds, enlarging our perspective on our griefs, and then getting back to work.